I had big plans for the summer of 2022. But the biggest was driving the Dempster Highway up through Inuvik to Taktoyakta, a small town on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Unfortunately, I had an accident and ended up spending most of the summer bedridden. Luckily, by the time I was in good enough shape to start moving again, it was still August. Which meant I still had a couple of weeks of time to travel somewhere, and I really wanted to see some of the north. So instead of putting pedal to the metal and just going straight to tuck, I decided to take it slow and enjoy the scenery. I was super excited, as I've spent most of my time exploring southern BC and was quite unfamiliar with the north. This video is going to be a little different from the rest of my videos. Due to the nature of my injury, a broken arm and ankle, I couldn't do a whole lot of hiking and moving around to really remote backcountry areas. So a lot of my footage was shot in and around my car. I'll share some of my thoughts and musings that I wrote in my journal while I was traveling. If you want the full story of my journey, including details on my route, you can check out my blog at nomorewastedays.ca. Heading out on my own was surprisingly stressful. After living by myself for five months, and already going through the process of uprooting my life once, I initially thought it would be easy. However, after my accident, I spent eight weeks living inside, not doing a whole lot, being looked after and always having someone around. Driving into the north was so different from my reality at the time that it took me a while to settle into my new reality of being on my own and back in the woods. Here we are on the morning of day two. Uh, last night I drove up the Gray Creek Forest Service Road and camped at a campsite, I believe it's called uh, Cooper's Lake Rec Site. Um, nothing special, just kind of a little open area. Campfire band still on, so no campfires for me, unfortunately. Uh, I just figured I'd show you guys what my sleeping setup is. So here in the back of the truck, I've got this uh, box here that sort of makes the more permanent solid structure of my sleeping pad, of my sleeping platform. Uh, it actually works great uh, when I'm not camping just for storage as a shelf so I can put stuff underneath and stuff on top. So I can keep my tools and all my like oil and everything under here or off to the side. And then if I'm shopping or whatever, stuff can go on top of it. So here I've got my platform, I've got my sleeping pad, my bag, my pillow. But for the length over here, what I actually have is I've got this platform and I built these, I made it so I can slide these 2x4s or 2x2s into the slats and then this whole thing just slides in and out as I need it. And it sits on these this hinged thing here. So that hinges, these hinge up and down, uh, so that when I store it away or when I'm driving, it sits flat. Uh, and yeah, so that gives me about six, six and a half feet of length. Uh, it's quite cozy. The only downside is that there isn't much room from the top. If I sleep in the back, it's a little higher, which is nice but I can't really raise my knees and getting changed and whatnot inside is difficult. So it's pretty much, pretty much universally for sleeping. So that's my sleeping setup. Um, today I'm going to be heading over to Kimberly and then continuing on north up to Radium Hot Springs and into the Rockies towards Jasper. <laughs> That morning, I left camp around 10 a.m., making my way back down to the pavement. The scenery was beautiful, 
and the day was quite hot, so I had to make a couple stops along the way. These horses belong to. That night, I stayed in Radium Hot Springs with a buddy. The next day, I headed into the Rockies, stopping at Marble Canyon, which is the site of the oldest known vertebrate fossil. I then went up through Icefields Parkway. Just like the last time I was in the Rockies, I was blown away by the scenery. That night, I camped at the headwaters of the Fraser River. On night five, I stayed outside of Prince George, and it was the first night I was properly alone. It was getting dark by the time I left Prince George, so I just pulled into a spur off a of Forest Service Road, probably about 25 kilometers out of the city. Admittedly, it was a little spooky. I have a theory that our mind occupies the space you can see. That's why when you're on top of a mountain or in the middle of the ocean or a desert, you feel very insignificant and humbled. The space gives your brain time to breathe and to think. But as night settles, the space you can see only gets smaller, and your thoughts begin to turn inward. And I definitely began to have the same thoughts and experiences that night outside of Prince George. A feeling of utter gratitude that people actually want to hang out with me and missing all the people who have got me to where I was at that point in my life. The following morning, after packing up and heading out, I saw my first ever wild moose. Unfortunately, I was only able to capture it on my phone. A few days later, I was heading north along the Niska Highway, just north of Terrace, which runs into the Nass River Valley home of the indigenous Niska people for thousands of years. This highway takes you through an extremely culturally and geologically significant area. About 300 years ago, several cracks opened up in the earth and lava began to spill out. It's believed that the eruption continued for days. Due to the relatively high population density at the time, it destroyed several villages and killed thousands of people. In some places, the lava got up to 12 meters deep. I was absolutely blown away at the destruction of it. 300 years later and still, the area was desolate. In many areas, the black basalt lay spread out like the charred, lifeless lands of Mordor, blistering hot and uninhabitable in the hot summer sun. However, in many places, you could see nature fighting back and undergoing succession to bring life back into the wasteland. The lichens were growing on the rocks, breaking them down into sand where the succulents and other hardy plants could then establish themselves. The organic matter from those would then provide the soil for more diverse plant life, which would then also contribute to the soil buildup. In some places, massive sinkholes had appeared likely from the lava flowing beneath the surface, receding back into the earth, leaving what is known as a lava tube. Afterwards, the cooled rock above would cave into that now empty crevice. These sinkholes created overhangs, forming areas protected from the sun, 
allowing even ferns to grow in this mini desert created by the eruption. 300 years and nature was coming back. Perhaps in a thousand more years, the woods will take over and scientists will have to dig through several layers of soil to even see the black rock that currently blankets the area. This is exactly what I've been looking for. A nice spot to take a dip in the water. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's eagles going. This is just absolutely spectacular. I eventually found myself heading towards Stewart, a small coastal town that is Canada's most northerly ice-free port. The drive down the highway to Stewart was a nice surprise as I entered back into the dramatic mountains of the coast. There is even a glacier just off the highway that you can hike or canoe over to and walk on. Beyond Stewart, the highway passes into Hyder, Alaska, before entering back into BC. The highway eventually takes you up to 1,200 meters above sea level, overlooking North America's largest glacier that you can drive up to. Not quite directly on it, but you get above it. I spent several hours here marveling at the size. Below, I could see places where the glacier was cracking, showing that it must have been several stories deep. The previous night, I met a man from Texas named Sean at the campsite I stayed at. He was up at the glacier, and we spent a few hours chatting. He joined me as I continued onward down the mountain, and did some off-roading, discovering some fun wheeling roads that took us to an awesome secluded campsite overlooking the glacier. It wasn't until I left Stewart and continued on my journey that I really started feeling like I was in the north. The mountains faded away as I went east again and entered the rolling forested hills that spanned for hundreds of kilometers. The road got more rough and no longer had painted lines. Occasionally, I would pull over and just sit in the silence and marvel at the vastness and seemingly untouched wilderness. Of course, logging is huge in northern BC, but in many places it was hidden well. I decided to take a day to drive out to Telegraph Creek, a tiny old town along the Stikine River. This drive takes you down into a canyon formed by the Stikine. I couldn't help but think to compare it to the Grand Canyon in its morphology and size, but I was a bit hesitant to use the analogy, 
until I googled it and found out that it is in fact referred to as the Grand Canyon of the Stikine. I really wish it wasn't as windy as it was when I went through, because I really wanted to fly my drone down into the canyon. I also got to see some daredevil stone sheep on a cliff face across the canyon. Being on your own for extended periods of time gives you lots of space to think. I made a point of minimizing my time listening to podcasts and music and never listened to any while I was in camp. When I first headed out from Castlegar, my anxiety was pretty intense. I always assumed it was the distance or the time that stressed me out. But during my trip I realized it was neither. What really freaks me out is the future. When you live the same life day to day, it's easy to convince yourself that time isn't moving. You become comfortable and days and weeks and months merge into each other. You spend less time in the unknown, and stepping into the unknown, the future is terrifying. But much like being trapped on a raft on a large river, even though the raft moves with the water around it, the greater world continues to pass you by, and if you only stare at the water, you'll never notice what you've missed. Time continues to move on, and the future is always coming, even if you aren't paying attention. Sometimes I look back to my life five or ten years ago, what I was doing, where I was, and who I was. Then I think about my life now, but most importantly, I think about the time that has passed between then and now, the experiences that have shaped me and brought me to this place. The memories of those in-between times comfort me, reminding me to just enjoy the moment, and that in the end, everything will turn out okay. On my first night in the Yukon, I was sitting by my campfire and noticed the sky was much brighter than it should have been for midnight. Then it dawned on me what I was seeing. I ran out to the highway to get a better view of the ribbons of the aurora borealis as they danced above me in the night sky on a bed of twinkling stars. On my second night in the Yukon, I was camping on the side of a lake in an unofficial campsite with nobody around, just off the Alaska Highway. Before going to bed, I wandered out to the middle of the road and watched as the northern lights began to appear in the sky again. I realized I was likely the only person within several kilometers standing in the middle of the Alaskan highway on a perfectly clear night with the stars and the northern lights above. I took a few deep breaths, savoring the novelty and uniqueness of where I was. I will never forget that moment. On my first night back in BC, I stayed at what was my favorite campsite on my whole trip, down a random road off the highway onto the banks of the Liard River. Once I finished setting up the site, as always, it was time to make a fire.
So one of the quality of life things that I have built into my Pathfinder is this table here. So it's just a piece of plywood with some chains that are hooked up to these little loops on either side. It's quite simple. It's got some S hooks here. There's actually nothing holding it in on the back other than just pressing up against the rigid bed. Um, and when I hook it up, it sits slightly above flush so that when I put weight down, it pushes backwards. And it's actually really strong. I can hold uh, my stove, cookware, the propane for the stove, and even like a full thing of food and groceries on this side. Um, I don't know if I trust it enough to sit on it, but it can definitely comfortably hold. At this point, I've gone it up to about 25 pounds. It's a good, it's a good little thing to have when I'm camping out in the backcountry with no table or anything, and just a place to to prep food if I'm going to be prepping food or just lay things out. It's nice to have. Continuing down the Alaskan highway took me past Muncho Lake. This stretch of the highway is fascinating as it cuts through the northern Rocky Mountains. And there are huge amounts of glacial alluvium from past millennia deposited in the valley and in riverbeds. Once again, the magnitude of it was incomprehensible to my simple brain. A little interesting tidbit that I noticed about the north. Locations that appear to be listed as towns in Google Maps are typically more like hubs. There's a gas station, hotel, restaurant, bakery, gift shop, and mechanic all in one place. You drive past them and poof, you're immediately back in the wilderness. I took this photo on my last morning on my own. For the previous two weeks, my Pathfinder had been my safe haven, literally the center of my life. Walking away with it open and everything inside it was an interesting perspective on how even though something can seem huge, taking a few steps back reveals it to be quite small in the grand scheme of things. I view life as a novel. I know, hot take. However, I think of my brain as the author and my memory as the manuscript. When nothing happens to a character for extended periods of time, an author will often reduce it down to a sentence or two. Days, weeks, months, and even years can be condensed into a few words, indicating the passage of time. However, when something exciting happens, like a big battle in a fantasy story, or a break and enter to get some clues in a mystery novel, a few minutes in a story can take up pages, or even a full chapter. I believe that is how our brains record our lives. It's pointless to actively remember the menial day-to-day, -to, -day, to fill the pages with the same thing over and over again. Nobody would ever read that book. Unfortunately, we can't put our lives down and pick up a new one because we find this one boring. And what ends up happening, due to our brain's decision to not actively record everything that is repeated, is we don't get to watch as the time slowly ticks away. No. What happens is one day we just suddenly realize that the past two years can be summed up in a handful of sentences. And that's terrifying. But while we can't put down our lives and start a new one, we can change what is written. Do more stuff that excites you, interests you, and terrifies you. Writing a novel is hard work, something few people will ever do. Writing a good novel is even harder. It's much easier to not write one at all. But when I get to the end of my story, I don't want it to be a handful of uninspired sentences. I want it to be an epic tale of conquest and defeat, of beautiful landscapes and towering cities, of jagged peaks that slice through the clouds and never-ending expanses of flat land where the sky steals the show of dancing to music in the daytime and silently contemplating the stars at night, of creeping glaciers and rushing rivers, of dense jungle and barren lava flows, of novelty,
culture and life. It's true when I say I'm scared to death of the future, but it's coming whether we like it or not. The only thing we truly have control over is how interesting our past is.